Hi, Nashville Church. Adrian and I and the kids have been out of town for the past week, and it's been a really intense week. And I uh, got back in last night and had some great time with Priestley and Marilyn and, and Barry and Debbie. Uh, just talking about what are the needs of the church right now, we felt is very important just tonight to come together and to share some thoughts and look at some scriptures. And uh, I know as, as I've thought about what's been going on, one of the things I think about is I like to run. I like to just go out in the neighborhood, go out different places to run. And I've never once felt my life threatened or worried about going for those runs. And yet I know that in talking to different brothers and sisters, that, that some of these events of the past few months, that's exactly how some of my brothers and sisters feel, is, is just afraid, afraid of what kinds of things can happen. And, and just the, the injustices that have gone on and, uh, and that really that need to change for all of us to be able to feel safe. At the same time, we know that God is in control and that we have to look to God for our peace. But, but I, I definitely want the, the brothers and sisters in the congregation that are feeling fear, that are feeling hurt or disappointment or discouragement to know that we want to be right there with you. Even though I've never lived a day in this country as a black man and I can't relate to what that would be, um, I, I want you to know that I, I support you and I, and I support those feelings, that those feelings are just things that, 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 that you have to process and you have to work through. And to whatever extent I can, I want to be right there with you. And I, I encourage and I call all the brothers and sisters in the church, let's, let's, let's have each other's back. Let's, let's be there for each other. Let's process all this together. And especially if, if like me, you have never been a minority. You have never been a person of color in a society that really historically has always been um, dominantly a, a, a white society, that we, we listen, that we have empathy, that we hear what our brothers and sisters are feeling, and we validate those feelings. And... Um, you know, one of the scriptures I've thought about as I've thought about these things is Philippians 1.27. It says, whatever happens, you know, and I think Paul's talk, thinking about all kinds of different things. He's in prison. But whatever happens, you know, whether it's all kinds of injustice and, and horrible things that go on, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And, and I love the unity in this and the idea that, hey, things are going to happen. And, and we live in a fallen world, and we're going to feel the effects of that. But whatever happens, we can come together, and we can, we can stand firm in the spirit, we can strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. And that's my hope and dream is that that's our, our response as a church to these challenges is that we really come together. And I know I really appreciate what Priestley and Barry shared on Sunday. And uh, I want to go ahead and make sure that, that everybody in the church is able to, to see that and hear that. I know maybe some weren't able to see or hear that on Sunday because of some technical difficulties. And so we're going to show that right now so that we're on the same page. Good morning. Let me start by saying I do not want to suggest what others should think, especially when I have not asked how you are doing or even feeling. As elders of the Greater Nashville Church, Barry Holt and myself, Priestley Reeves, would like to take this time to speak to the hearts of everyone listening right now. It is difficult to express the thoughts and feelings that I have flooding my heart regarding the recent killings of Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, unarmed black men that made national news. Events like these affect us all on some level or another. Some of these events hit closer to home for people of color. My goal is not to retell the story of lives lost, but it must be told to bring about change. Let me fast forward. Our church has committed to not be silent. We have not arrived or even begun to do enough. We desire to do things God's righteous way. We are addressing everyone 
especially our brothers and sisters that need help dealing with trauma at the hands of injustice. This is not a time that we are offering platitudes and cliches. I have a range of emotions that include outright rage, anger, sadness, hurt, and fear. I've experienced racism in many forms. One of my earliest memories occurred when I was 12 years old, being stopped by the police and searched with no explanation as I tried to get on a bus. On another occasion, while waiting in line with dozens of other people that did not look like me, a white officer approached me and commented that I was the reason that policemen carried guns as he walked by. When I leave my home, my fashion sense is not based on style, but survival. So as a black man, this is not new, but an all too familiar narrative. Romans 7.25 reads, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Just like I was chosen, I choose to live a new life based on Jesus and his righteousness. You know, my heart aches over the violent and senseless loss of lives of Ahmaud Aubrey and most recently George Floyd. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families and friends and to all who have been impacted by their tragic deaths. And I know many of you are hurting and wrestling with a lot of feelings and emotions of sadness, anger, frustration, fear, hopelessness, and asking the question, what can I do? I too am wrestling along with you with many of these same feelings and emotions and asking myself the same question, what can I do? My first thought was, I can pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, pray. And as a white man, I pray specifically for my eyes to be open, to see the injustice that's all around me, and the pain it causes my African American brothers and sisters, and move my heart to action. I beg God to put an end to racism and bring healing to the wounded. I can and must stay connected to God, stay in His Word, keep in step with the Spirit, bringing my feelings and my emotions under His control. I had a conversation with a sister, Janice Cottrell, this week who shared with me that she would be a mess if it were not for her staying connected to God through His Word and prayer during these challenging times. Another thought I had was, I can care, I can love. I can be there with and for my brothers and sisters in their pain. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, If one part suffers, every part suffers. And as a white man of privilege, I can't begin to understand or relate to what my brothers of color experience on a daily basis. I don't know what it's like to fear being pulled over by the police and wondering if I will make it home alive or not, or to fear for my children's life because of the color of their skin. But as a brother in Christ, I can care, I can love, I can support, I can learn, I can read books, I can listen and seek to understand. I have a responsibility according to Isaiah 1, 17. It says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed. I can stand together with my brothers and sisters as we fight together to bring about true equality and peace. We are in this fight together. And we must remember, this is a spiritual battle. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. But our battle is against Satan and the spiritual forces of evil. And we must be alert to Satan's schemes and his desire to divide and destroy our relationships with one another. And ultimately, our relationship with God. So let us wage war together using the spiritual weapons that God provides. Love, humility, and compassion. 
and let us be the light that shines brightly, exposing the darkness and lights the path of love to God and one another. So what are we saying? We want to encourage you to come to us. We want to listen to you. We desire to walk with you. We want to help you through this. We love you and are here for you. We need to partner as brothers and sisters in God's kingdom to stand firm against injustice that destroys the ability to see Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you and thank you for being a loving, compassionate, and merciful Father. We ask that you uh, strengthen and comfort the Aubrey and Floyd families during this time of tragic loss. And Father, I also ask that you bring comfort to all who are hurting and to bring healing and peace to your people. Father, please forgive us of our sins. And may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We love you and we pray all this in the power of your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you all and may God's peace be with you. Amen. Thank you, Barry and Priestley, for uh, your thoughts on Sunday, just for your wisdom and your hearts and how much you love the church. You know, Barry was referencing Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, where it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We, we need to be aware of Satan's schemes. We need to be aware that we are at war. Whether we like it or not, Satan is at war with the church. And, and it's important to understand that. It's important to understand, brothers and sisters, that Satan is coming after not the world, not the people that are out there and, and that are obviously living lives that, that they are not following Jesus. Satan is coming after us. He's coming after the church. That is his end game and his goal with all this. You think about the things that have happened this year with COVID and with how he has tried certainly to separate us. And we have fought, I think, valiantly to be intentional and to come together. But it's just not the same to come together on Zoom and to have these kind of you know, videos and virtual times as it is to see each other, to hug each other, to, to connect. And I think that's Satan wanting to divide us. And in addition, you know, he is not only caused, but put totally front and center the, the issues with Ahmaud Arbery, the, the tragedies really with Ahmaud Arbery, with Breonna Taylor, with George Floyd, with riots, with looting. And, and that's just to mention the things that are making the most headlines. We know that sin is everywhere and that hurt is everywhere and, and that these are just some of the, 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 the scariest stories. And, and this is Satan attacking and we've got to understand this is a part of Satan's schemes is that he wants us to respond in a way where we, we drift away from God and we drift away from one another. And we've got to decide we're going to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, that we're going to take our stand against the devil's schemes, that we are going to fight and that we are going to remember who the enemy is. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 3, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The war that we're fighting is, is in our thinking. It's in how we process these things. It's in how we respond. We're not picking up weapons. The weapons that we fight with are in and we've got to be aware of that. And, and you know what? We can't ignore these issues and we will not be silent about the injustices in our society. And, and I realize that as a church, and I'm talking about just the Christian church at large, we have not done a good job of talking about these things, about expressing these things. And, uh, and I'm sorry that we haven't just again at large. And, and it's something that we, we are wanting to be very intentional about continuing to talk about. And, uh, and it really needs to change. And the church needs to be a part of, 
of helping that to change. And I'm really grateful for the diversity team in our family of churches. A few years back, the International Churches of Christ formed a diversity team to help us explore and work on these things. And uh, so we had a, a big call on Monday night. The diversity team hosted a time for all the church leaders in the U.S. There were over 350 uh, participants on this call. Titus and I actually both got to be, be a part of this and, and learn. And uh, the, the team is made up of a lot of different brothers and sisters. Some of the folks who spoke were Scott Kirkpatrick, Michael Burns, who both have been here to Nashville in the past few years, uh, James Campbell from Miami, Ben Barnett in Atlanta, Mia Brantley in Columbia, South Carolina, and Chris Jacobs, who's an elder in Denver. And it was just a phenomenal time. And some of the highlights for me were, uh, you know, it was talked about how there, there can be a tendency in Christianity to go to one extreme or the other in response to these things. One extreme is we're just going to, you know, not even talk about these things or address these things, and we're just going to talk about, uh, you know, spiritual things and Jesus and, and, and sharing Jesus with people and seeking and saving the lost and trying to be good Christians. Um, and obviously all that is good. There's nothing wrong with that, but, but basically not even address the issues that are going on. But then the other extreme can, can be um, we're going to just focus on trying to change society and to try to change the system and, and social gospel is what it's been called in the past. And, and we're going to focus all of our energy not on heaven, but on the here and now and almost to the exclusion of heaven. And, and people can really go one direction or the other. And, and when we look at Jesus' ministry, that's just not what Jesus did. Jesus called us to live kingdom lives now. Jesus called us to be the kingdom, to live here and now what we're going to experience and live in heaven. And that's what Jesus called us to, and that's what he modeled. And if you think about Jesus' ministry, he, he, he went to the downcast. He went to the down and out. He went to those who are marginalized and minimized in society, and he wrapped his arms around them and he tried to pull them in, and he defended them, and he cared about them, and he communicated, you have value in God's eyes. You know, he, he communicated that every life does really matter. And, and that wasn't exactly the way many of the rabbis and many of his contemporaries uh, communicated, and yet that's who he was, and he did so vocally. Now, but he also communicated that, hey, my way is not going to be the way that we are going to cater to our instincts and our sinful nature and violently revolt and violently demand our rights, that was not Jesus' way either. And, and so we see that Jesus was willing to embrace people, but at the same time, he, he was going to not fight with the world's weapons, but he was going to use God's weapons. And so I think that the questions that some of these things pose for me and for us is, where is our allegiance? Is our allegiance to being a kingdom people? Is really that our primary identity and allegiance? Uh, will we be a prophetic community that is different from the world and that is responding in a way that really draws people's attention to God and to what God envisions his kingdom here on earth to be? You know, the other thing that was talked about by a lot of different people on this call was just that we need to be sensitive as a church to the things that people are feeling through these events. And, uh, and we need to acknowledge, um, and we need to uh, just allow people to work through and to process these things. And one of the things we can do is, is encourage dialogue and create opportunities for people to come together and to talk. And uh, you know, many of the churches have had different online meetings or they're planning online meetings for people to, to, to lament, to pray, to ask God for healing, and, and to look to God for hope. And, so on Sunday, we want to do the same. On Sunday, from 3 to 4.30 will be one opportunity. And then from 5.30 to 7 will be another opportunity where we're going to set up some Zoom calls where uh, we'd like to invite the entire church to pick one of those two times and to come together and have a time to talk, to listen, to pray together, to cry together, to, to mourn. To, to share whatever it is that's on our hearts. Now, because we're asking the whole church to do this, uh, everybody's just going to have a few minutes to share, and we're going to send out more details. But this is going to be a time to really be vulnerable and open. This is not a time to assign blame. Um, this is a time just to really go to God together as a community 
And we also realize that this is just going to be one step of many, that at one time on Sunday is not going to heal everybody, and that we need to find opportunities with people we're close to in our small groups to continue these discussions and to continue to talk. But it's a step we're excited about. The other thing that the diversity team is doing is they're organizing a devotional, a diversity devotional online on Saturday at 11 a.m. And again, we'll get more information out there to you about that as we get it. You know, our theme for this year, we've talked about many times, right? Connected from 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If we're willing to lay down our lives for each other, then we also would be willing to lay down our opinions and our very strong feelings for each other in order to come together and to be connected. I think we have been given the opportunity to really learn how to love. This is how we know what love is. We imitate Jesus' example. We, we set aside the things we're so passionate about in order to love our brothers and sisters. And so I think that the two members of our church with the most extreme views on either side should be able, applying the scripture, to come together and to lovingly and respectfully listen to each other and try to understand each other. That doesn't mean they're going to walk away thinking the same way, but if we really love each other in this way, then we're willing to accept that people view things the way that they view them, and we're going to hear one another. And I think that that's really what our theme of Connected this year is about, is are we going to forge and build the kinds of connections that really bring us together the way God wants us to be together? Let me give you a, a simple illustration. You know, you can think about Legos, right? Uh, you know, many of us play with Legos as kids. You know, you have these two blocks, and they become connected. They snap together, and they're pretty solidly together. And just because of the way they're designed, that they stick together. Another type of block is Jenga blocks. And so these also, you can build with them, and they're connected, as, as you see here. But, you know, depending on the type of connection, you're going to get different results. And, and there are different types of connections. You might feel like, oh, man, I'm really connected. But do you have a Jenga type of connection, or do you have a Lego type of connection? And in terms of how we build the church, this is very, very important. Because when Satan strikes, we, we see the difference. And so, you know, if you build a, a tower here out of Jenga blocks, and Satan strikes, it's a mess. And it, it, it doesn't hold up. Yes. There was connection there, but it wasn't solid connection. But if you do the same thing, if Satan strikes a block of Legos, they stick together. And, and, and yes, I mean, they're, they're, they're removed, they're, they're challenged, but they stick together, they stand firm together. And these are the kinds of connections that Jesus wants us to forge and that are forged when we learn to love the way that Jesus does. I think we've got a lot to learn and an opportunity to learn during this time about how we communicate and how we connect with one another. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So if we're walking in the light, then our thinking becomes there's nothing that I want to do that's going to cause my brother or sister to stumble. Is this how you think? Are you thinking this way during this time with the way you communicate, with the things you say? Are you thinking in terms of, man, the last thing I would want to do is to cause my brother and sister to stumble? In Matthew chapter 12, in verses 36 and 37, it says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We're going to have to give an account for every empty word we have spoken. Let's not be speaking empty words. Let's not be just throwing opinions and feelings out there without regard to how it's going to make our brothers and sisters feel. And we have to be aware that we are a part of a congregation that is diverse, that has people with many different opinions. And I think we can be 
sometimes very free just to throw our opinions out there and not think about, is it going to cause someone to stumble? In James chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Does this describe us? Does this describe how we're communicating and connecting with each other? Are we quick to listen? Are we slow to speak? Are we slow to become angry? You know, I think sometimes we're not aware of the levels of communication. In a society where we, we depend on technology more and more, I think we can just think that communication is communication, but that's not true. The, the, the most uh, effective way to communicate is face-to-face, person-to-person, in the flesh. You're right there with somebody. You can, you can understand every form of communication, nonverbal communication, body language, facial expression, tone, volume, inflection, you know, everything about what they're saying, and there's so much that's communicated outside of just the words. And, and so when, that's really when we're able to connect the best is when we communicate that way. And then, you know, you go on from there and, well, you have video conferencing and, and the ability to, to communicate through videos, which you can still get a lot of it, but not all of it. And then, you know, on the phone, obviously you can hear, but you can't see. And, and then, you know, uh, through, through uh, verbal communication, just through writing messages, through, through maybe an email or a letter or a note that's, that's longer, maybe you're expressing yourself more. You know, then text message, you know, generally text messages are shorter. Uh, they're, they're easy sometimes to misunderstand because we're trying to be to the point. You know, and then um, there's group text messages which become more impersonal because, hey, it's not directly to me, it's the whole group of people. And, and I think the least effective way, in my opinion, to communicate is social media because it's just, you're just putting it out there to the world. You don't even really know necessarily who's going to read it. I know with social media, you can also direct message, but that's more like a text. You know, and so social media is the least direct way and least effective way to connect with another individual, and yet it has become, for many people, the first place they go to express themselves and the first place they go to, to get their, their thoughts out there. And if you think about this passage in James 1, if we want to be quick, to listen, isn't social media the opposite of quick to listen? How do you listen through social media? I mean, I know you can go see what other people have to say, but really, social media is about expressing what I think and what I feel. And I think because we're so free to go post whatever we think and feel on social media, I don't think we think often about, is this going to cause somebody to stumble? I think the other thing that can happen is you see something that you don't like, and what do you do? Well, you jump into the comments and you post, and then somebody posts back at you, and all of a sudden we have this back and forth, and, and, and sometimes it's so sad, but we have disciples of Jesus engaged in these online arguments for the whole world to see because we're, we're not thinking about causing people to stumble. We're not thinking about being quick to listen. We're not listening. We're just saying what we think, wouldn't it be better to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, you posted this on social media. This is how it made me feel, but maybe I misunderstood. I want to understand where you're coming from. I want to understand why you're putting these things, but I also want you to know how it makes me feel, how it might make other people like me feel. Wouldn't it be better to, to connect in that way and to talk through it? And brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be better before we just go blasting everything we think on social media to stop and think, could this cause a brother or sister of mine to stumble? Could, could this be a problem for them? Now, now, now the other side of this is, um, you know, the anger, right? Be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And so some people might say, yeah, you shouldn't be angry at all. That's not what the passage says. It doesn't say anger is bad. It just says, don't be quick to become angry, and don't allow your anger to become this human anger that is destructive. But anger is, is an emotion that God has and that God has given us. And even if you think about the stages of grief, you think about, okay, what are the stages of grief? It's, it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. 
So the stages of grief can give us some insight into you know, people's emotions. If, if you see somebody who's angry, has it ever occurred to you that maybe they're going through these stages of grief? Maybe they're grieving. Maybe they've experienced something that's causing them to feel a lot. And, and as opposed to dismissing those feelings or saying that those feelings are wrong, has your heart ever gone out to that brother or sister and said, hey, how can I help? What can I do? I see that you're hurting. It, you know, if, if you had a, a friend who lost a, a mother, a father, a sibling, and they were angry about the situation or just, they just felt anger, wouldn't your heart be to, to go to that person and love them and ask them how you could help and how are you doing and how can I support you as opposed to judging those feelings? And I think that, that we can be very insensitive to the fact that other people, they're just, they're, they're grieving, they're hurting. On the call that I was on on Monday, one of the brothers, a black evangelist in Miami, he said, hey, you know, the black members of your congregations, they know how they should respond. They know they need to fix their eyes on Jesus. They know they need to not be anxious about anything. You know, that they, they know that they shouldn't, you know, be, be responding maybe with the, the anger or rage that they do, but they, they just need time to process those feelings and emotions. You need to give them time to process those things. And I, I think sometimes we can, we can respond in a very impatient and unloving way. And, and we need to understand that it's very possible that people are just are going through this process and we need to give them time and space. Now, as we wrap up here, you know, sometimes we can feel like, okay, but you know what, I've got to voice my opinion. You're telling me not to post things, not to say things, and not to, you know, to worry about what people think. And I just, I have to say what I feel, and I've got to express myself. And, and then, okay, that's fine. But what is shaping the way that you are expressing yourself? What is it that's, that's shaping you and your response? Is your response being shaped by a biblical conviction and a kingdom mindset, or maybe by something else. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping with one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, Watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What's this saying? It's saying, hey, we have a choice. Am I going to respond in a way that I'm led by the Spirit, which means walking humbly in love and, and loving my neighbor as myself? Or am I going to respond according to the flesh, which is biting and devouring? Uh, you know, my brothers and sisters and the people around me. And you just we all just need to take a look at our responses and ask ourselves, am I being led by the Spirit or am I being led by my sinful nature? I've, I've been reading a book um, that, that talks about just a lot of these concepts that we read in the New Testament and, and what they look like in first century life. And it talks about this passage. It says, Christian freedom is a very different thing from modern Western notions of freedom. We celebrate our freedom to speak our mind in public, no matter who we hurt. The Christian's freedom is always directed by love for the other, not concern for our own rights and desires. It seeks opportunities to serve in the name of Jesus, not to indulge oneself in the name of our rights. You know, are we thinking along Western lines as we, as we defend our right to say what we want to say? Or maybe we should step back and say, okay, but am I, am I really thinking about my brothers and sisters? Am I serving them humbly in love? You know, finally in Philippians chapter 2, a passage we all know in verse 1, it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in the same book, the author says about this passage, in, in the, rights, the rights culture of modern America, this is definitely a countercultural way of life. Paul's standard of love means abstaining from one's own rights if the full exercise of one's freedom will offend and tear down a sister or brother. Our commitment to enjoying and forcing our rights inevitably results in shattering the body of Christ into ever more splinters. It is an American way, but not a Christian way. And so as we go through this really challenging time in our country, how are we responding? Are we responding as Americans? Or are we responding as followers of Jesus? What was Jesus' approach? It was to love one another as he loved us, to imitate his way of loving. And so we, we can ask ourselves, okay, would Jesus do this? Would Jesus say this? Would Jesus post this? You know, Jesus wasn't about um, turning, turning away from changing the world. Jesus was all about changing the world. Jesus came to change the world. But Jesus chose to do so one person at a time. Jesus wants his followers to be a unified, prophetic community who point people to God.